On the recommencement of hostilities, the army was posted as follows. Bernadette occupied the left behind the passage from the first half, having his right on the bridge of Spandau, where he had constructed a good bridgehead. On his right was Marshal Sewell, whose headquarters were at Moringen. His troops were on the passage, the bridge of which he had cut. The emperor was dissatisfied with the cutting of this bridge, and he said to us, You see, Bernadette did better. He kept his bridge, while Sewell cut his though he had greater reason than Bernadette to preserve it. By this means, he disabled himself from assisting Ney, whom the Russians probably would not have attacked. Had they known that Sewell had preserved the bridge, crossed the passage, because in that case, the corps, which turned Ney, would have been exposed to total destruction. On the right of Sewell was Marshal Ney, and on the right of the latter, Davu. The rest were in the second line. After the affair of Gutstadt, the Russians attempted also to force Marshal Bernadotte and his bridgehead of Spanden. They were repulsed, and the marshal was wounded by a ball which entered behind his ear. He was obliged to quit the army and was succeeded by General Victor. The latter had just been exchanged for General Blucher, who, it will be recollected, was made prisoner at Lubeck. The Russians committed the error of not retiring immediately, and thus afforded us time to come up. And Marshal Sewell, who was on the left of Marshal Ney, marched on Gutstadt, now right, to which was attached the corps of Marshal Davout, also moved from Osterroda on Gutstadt, General Victor and Marshal Mortier, who were on the left and in the center, marched before them crossing the passage at Spanden. The brigaded grenadiers, the guards, and the troops newly arrived from France also marched from the neighborhood of Finkenstein on Gunstadt. The cavalry did the same. This movement was executed with incredible rapidity on the 8th of June, always concentrated behind the passage, which was crossed on the 9th. We drove before us enemies like cavalry, and on the same evening, we entered Gunstadt early in the morning of the 10th. We began to descend the Alla, and towards evening the enemy's rear guard was driven on the bank of that river at Hillsburg. The chief portion of the enemy's army occupied the right bank, which is much higher than the left. All his artillery was posted there. The Grand Duke of Berg persisted in charging with his cavalry. It had performed prodigies during the whole of the morning, but on arriving beneath the enemy's cannon, it was so assailed that it was obliged to fall back. This it did in disorder, and it was pursued by some Russian squadrons who threw it into complete disorder. The emperor, from the point on which he was making his observations, saw this ill-advised engagement, and to prevent a disaster, he dispatched to the Grand Duke's assistance the brigade of fusiliers of the guard with 12 pieces of cannon under my command. This brigade, having been but recently formed, was not yet to be depended upon. It consisted of two regiments of very fine young men. Before I could reach the plain where the Grand Duke Berg was maneuvering, I had to pass through the long, marshy defile and a village. I did not commence my movement without some apprehension, for the road along which I had to pass was the only one by which our cavalry could retire if driven back before I could get clear out of it. However, there was no alternative, and I accordingly advanced as rapidly as possible, displaying the greatest front I could. All happened well, for hardly was I formed in the plain at the distance of 250 toises behind the defile, having in front two battalions deployed, my two wings in a close column, and my last piece of cannon just placed in battery, that I was overturned by the rout of our cavalry, which was falling back pell-mell with the Russian cavalry. I had only time to open the fire of my whole front, which checked the Russian cavalry and gave ours time to rally and form again. The Russian cavalry was followed by infantry and cannon, which they placed in rough redoubts before Hillsburg on the side where we were advancing. We were obliged to engage these. The firing of cannon and musketry was kept up briskly, and I should have come off badly had not one of Marshal Sewell's divisions, commanded by General St. Hilaire on my right, and a division of Marshal Lance, commanded by General Verdier on my left, added their fire to mine. As it was, I suffered considerably. I slept at 200 toises in advance of the spot where I had fought. 
But I sustained a considerable loss. I had to regret the death of the General Brigade Roussel and several of my cassons of ammunition, among which was a howitzer, exploded during the action and occasioned great mischief as we were in close order. But for the intrepidity of Colonel Grigny, the commander of our artillery who kept up a deadly fire, I should have been overwhelmed, sabered, and taken by the Russian cavalry who were surrounding me and dealing havoc among our troops. The danger was the greater as General St. Hilaire's division was in decided retreat. I had a sharp altercation with the Grand Duke of Berg, who, in the very heat of the action, sent me an order to advance and attack. I gave rather an angry answer to the officer who brought this order and asked him if he did not see what I was doing. The Grand Duke, who always loved to command, wanted me to suspend my fire at the moment when it was most brisk. And march forward. He would not be convinced that I should have been destroyed before I could arrive where he wanted me. For a quarter of an hour, my artillery had been exchanging discharges of grape shot with the Russians, and it was only the vivacity of the cannonade on my side which gave me the superiority. Night came on very opportunely, and while the army was reposing, the Emperor sent for me. He was well pleased with the first essay of my young corps, but he blamed me for not having paid more deference to the Grand Duke of Berg. In defending myself, I venture to say that the Grand Duke was a madcap who would someday or other cause the loss of an important battle and that it would be much better for us if he were less brave and had a little more common sense. The Emperor cut me short by observing that I was passionate, but he did not think the less of what had passed. Next day, June 11th, the Russians stopped all day in front of Hillsburg. Both parties removed their wounded, and we had as many as though we had fought a great battle. The emperor was very dissatisfied. Marshal Davout arrived, and he made him maneuver on our left. The single movement made the Russians quit their position before Hillsburg. They were across the Alla. And on the night of the 11th, they set out for Friedland. On the 12th, the Emperor slept at Healdsburg. According to his custom, he went to inspect a position which the enemy had occupied the day before. He was exceedingly angry when he saw how imprudently our troops had been exposed to a fire of grape shot from one bank of the river to the other. At Hillsburg, he learned from the Burgomaster that the Emperor of Russia and the King of Prussia had been in that town two days before and that they had departed before the army. Early on the morning of the 13th, we set out for Price Isla, where the Empress slept that night. Our cavalry could not furnish a precise account of the direction which the enemy had taken, and the Emperor and his cabinet gave orders for the march of our troops in three different directions, in one or the other of which the Russians must of necessity have sought to effect a passage in order to gain the banks of the Prago and cover Konigsberg. He judged the enemy's operations from what he himself would have done had he been in his place. Marshal Sewell with the Grand Duke of Berg marched on Konigsberg, where the Grand Duke affirmed that the enemy's army had retired. Tavu's corps marched on the right of Sewell's, and the Emperor kept the remainder of the army with him. On the preceding afternoon, the Emperor had ordered a movement by way of Friedland, General Udno, with the Brigade of Grenadiers was at the head of the column under the command of Marshal Land. General Nensudi's division of Curassiers was also attached to this column. Chapter 4. At daybreak on the 14th, General Udno's Grenadiers were in front of Friedland and the Russian army was on the other side of the river. The enemy, finding only the division, division of Grenadiers before him, conceived the project of attacking it with his superior force, never suspecting that it would be promptly supported. Accordingly, the Russians crossed the bridge and furiously attacked Marshal Land, who had the command of Udno's and Verdier's divisions. The days were now at the longest, and in the latitude in which we were, there is at this season of the year scarcely any night. The Emperor received notice of the attack almost immediately. He set out from Price Eilau, pressing the march of the foot and horse guards, as well as of Marshal Ney and Mortier and Bernadotte's corps. 
which were commanded by General Victor. He soon arrived on the field of battle where he found Marshal Lenn, who had just taken up a position at the entrance of the wood which bounds the circumference of the plain round Friedland. The Marshal had from daybreak supported with a very inferior force a combat which had already cost him a considerable number of men. The Emperor went himself to reconnoiter the Russian army. He did not believe that it would remain on this side of Friedland. He could not conceive its object since its forces were inferior to those which might be opposed to it. The enemy's position appeared to him so extraordinary that he dispatched on reconnaissances all the officers who were about him. He ordered me to advance alone along the wood on our right, seek a point whence the bridge of Friedland was visible, and after observing whether the Russians were crossing over to our bank or recrossing to the right to return with the information to him. This order was easily executed. I returned to inform the emperor that the Russians, instead of retiring, were on the contrary, all crossing to our bank of the river, and that their masses were sensibly augmenting, and that in an hour they might be expected to be in readiness. Well, said the emperor, I am ready now. I have an hour's advantage of them, and will give them battle since they wish it. This is the anniversary of Marengo, and today fortune is with me. He had formed his columns in the immense wood on the skirt of which Marshal Len was stationed. Only the artillery was on the great roads which ran through the wood. Fortunately for us, there were three fine openings in the wood wide enough to enable us to station in each a column of infantry and one of the cavalry or artillery. Everything had turned out as he Emperor expected. The troops were allowed to repose for half an hour, and in the meanwhile, it was ascertained by the most minute examination that the arms were in good condition and that each soldier had an abundant supply of ammunition. This being settled, the Emperor, who was on the ground, ordered all the bouts at once. His directions were given, as if for a maneuver at a review. Consequently, there was no hesitation. There was a defile to be passed before we could come within musket shot of the Russians. The emperor had foreseen this difficulty, and each column was directed to cross the defile by a different passage so that they all formed together on the other side. The chief portion of the cavalry was on our left. The emperor pressed the attack. Marshal Ney occupied the right on the field of battle. On his left in Echelon was the court of General Victor. On the left of the latter was Marshal Mortier, who had a very small force, and on the left of Mortier was Marshal Lant. In second line in the center was the guard, and in second line on its left was the brigade of fusiliers, of which the emperor made me resume the command for this action. At the commencement of the attack, the army was generally in echelon, its right in advance, and gently refusing its left. Marshal Ney commenced and engaged vigorously. His troops became impetuous and wished at the outset to dash forward to the Bridge of Friedland. The division which attempted this was so sharply repulsed that it would have driven back the rest of the corps. Had not a division of Marshal Victor's corps commanded by General Dupont very opportunely, and without an order from the marshal, changed his direction towards the right and briskly charged all who were pursuing Ney's troops. I heard the emperor bestow marked praise on this movement of General Dupont who he said had greatly contributed to the victory. Marshal Ney made his troops halt, formed them again, and renewed the attack so rapidly that his accident was scarcely perceived. General Dupont's movement was the signal for commencing the fire from one end of the line to the other, and here... As at Eilau, the discharge of artillery was terrific. Bernadotte's corps, which was commanded by General Victor, had assembled 48 pieces of cannon in one battery, and with this it received the Russian column, which advanced to attack it. The Russian general chief soon discovered the error he had committed when he found such a vast force where he expected to meet with only one division. He must have wished himself again on the other side of the river, but he could not attempt to recross without risking the destruction of his whole army. The gauntlet was thrown down, and he determined to take it up with good grace. We had already advanced so near him that he had only time to form in a number of squares which mutually flanked each other. And when once in this position, he deprived himself of the use of his artillery. He thus awaited the destruction, which had now become inevitable. His masses were heaped together in front of Friedland, driven close upon the town. They formed the center of a semicircle, of which we occupied almost the whole circumference. 
Not one of our cannonballs missed its aim, and the Russian squares were demolished one after another. About six in the evening, the Emperor assailed them with a fire of musketry. This was the finishing stroke! Their masses were so completely deranged that nothing like order was observable in their dispositions, and an instinct natural to man impelled all who formed part of the wreck to seek safety by flying towards the bridge. They were, however, obliged to renounce the attempt owing to the dreadful carnage caused by the firing of our artillery in that direction. They then threw themselves pell-mell into the river without ascertaining whether it was fordable. Numbers were drowned, but others discovered a fort in front of our left. Nothing could now check their flight, and they hurried towards the point of escape in order utter disorder like a flock of sheep. The Russians had on their right 22 squadrons of cavalry, which protected this retreat. We had upwards of 40, with which we ought to have charged them. But by an unexampled fatality, these squadrons received no orders. They were not even mounted and remained on foot during the whole of the battle. And on a vast space of ground behind our left, on seeing this, I sincerely regretted the absence of the Grand Duke of Berg. Had he been there, he would not have failed to employ these 40 squadrons, and then assuredly not a single Russian would have escaped us. Night drew in, and the firing ceased. Our army reposed in the position in which it had fought. The emperor also passed this night in bivouac. And next morning at daybreak, he was on his horse, inspecting the lines of his troops. The men were still sleeping and had suffered immense fatigue. The emperor would not allow any of them to be disturbed for the purpose of being drawn out under arms in honor of his arrival, as was customary. He next proceeded to the Russian field. Here, a frightful spectacle presented itself. The order of the Russian squares could be traced by a line of heaps of slain, and the position of their artillery might be guessed by the dead horses. It might surely be said that sovereigns ought to have great interests of their subjects at stake to justify such dreadful sacrifices. At Friedland, we took a great deal of artillery and four or five thousand prisoners, besides which... 15 and 20,000 wounded who fell into our hands. Chapter 7. The Russian army, which now consisted of only some battalions of the guards, took it all haste to the road of the Neiman by Tilsit. We lost no time in following it and arrived on the same day, the 15th, at Velau. On the Pragel, the Russians had burnt the bridge, but there was a good ford for the cavalry, and the infantry made a bridge with wood, of which there is abundance in this country. The emperor remained at Vilau all the 16th to make the army defile. On the same day, he received the news of the occupation to Konigsberg, which gave him great pleasure. He appointed me governor of that place, and also of old Prussia. The only instructions he gave me were to prevent plundering to take care of the hospitals, and to supply him abundantly with provisions and ammunition for the army marching on Tilsit. I arrived at Konigsberg on the 17th. Marshal Sewell had his headquarters there, and his army was encamped before the walls of the town. On examining the magazines, I was agreeably surprised at finding that they contained a stock of provisions sufficient to supply the whole of the Grand Army for at least four months. The possession of Konigsberg would have been of great advantage had it been necessary to continue the war. Our line of operations was established by that town, Brownsburg and Marienburg and Marienburg. The emperor was so provident that I was no sooner installed in my government at Konigsberg than I began to receive from the establishments. We had on different points of the Vistula entire columns of convalescent soldiers. These men, on leaving the hospitals where they had been cured of their wounds, were formed into marching battalions and joined to conscripts from France and placed under the direction of officers of different corps who had also been in the hospitals. On their arrival at Konigsberg, they were completely equipped and incorporated into the corps to which they respectively belonged before they were wounded. Some days, not less than 7,000 men came in, and in the course of a month, I received and forwarded to the different corps of the army more than 50,000 men. This great number of convalescents and the duty which I had to perform drew my attention to a branch of military administration of the great importance of which I was not before sufficiently aware. I was desirous of knowing the system followed in the hospital service. I made inquiries and obtained proofs of the solicitude of the emperor for the wounded was not less deserving of admiration than were his skillful combinations in the field of battle. That report 
which was some months after addressed to him by the intendant general, proves the attention he paid to all the details, which might have any influence in preserving the lives of the men. I shall here insert some passages of that remarkable document because they will enable the reader to appreciate the justice of the reproach cast on the emperor of indifference for the fate of the victims of war. A reproach very absurdly fabricated by writers who assuredly never knew anything of war themselves. First period. After the affair of Saalfeld and the Battle of Vienna, the number of the wounded amounted to more than 5,000. The rapid march of the army by difficult routes did not allow time for the hospital magazines to follow the general movement. There were then no other hospital resources to be had except such as were to be found in the case zones of the divisions and those which had been taken from the enemy, which were very insufficient. It was necessary to look to the country itself for resources. For this purpose, requisitions were imposed. And hospitals were established on all the points suitable for the reception of sick and wounded. The principal were Southfeld, Vienna, Erfurt, Schlitz, Weimar, Halle, Neuburg, ETC. Before the end of October, the hospital line was established for the army by Leipzig, Wittenberg, Potsdam, and Berlin. It was afterwards extended to Posen. In this last town, measures were adopted for procuring resources for the campaign of Poland. His Majesty ordered shirts to be made out of the cloth of 30,000 tents, which had just been taken at Berlin. This was a valuable prize at the moment, 4,596 mattresses and 6,535 coverlets were furnished by the towns of Kustrin, Stedden, Frankfurt, and Glogau. This supply, which cost 360 16,225 francs, 44 centimes, was deducted from the war contribution. And at the same time, the effects of the general magazine dispatch from Broberg were directed on Kustrin, the commissariat of the Army Corps, and the war commissaries of the divisions supplied by requisitions of articles which were destroyed in the different engagements. The defeat of General Blucher and the taking of Lubeck occasioned great numbers of wounded and fatigue had produced disease. Hospitals were open in Hamburg, Lüneburg, Lubeck, ETC, and supported at the expense of the country in general. Most of the hospital expenses until the arrival of the French army at Warsaw were supported by the conquered towns. The military chest furnished funds for the play of medical officers and other persons employed, as well as for the purchase of light articles of food for the sick and for defraying other extra expenses in various establishments. By this means, in less than two months, an hospital line of evacuation was established from Vienna, Hamburg, and Lübeck to Warsaw. Before the 1st of January, 1807, all the hospitals established in Württemberg and Bavaria were evacuated, and the patients were all dismissed, with the exception of 200 who were pronounced incurable, and were evacuated on Strasbourg. The only hospital which was still kept up in that part was that of Branau, which received the sick from the garrison. During this period, the mortality was in the proportion of 50 in the 1,000 patients, or 21 for 10,000 days. Second period. This period was more painful for the hospital service. The army was in a country where the communication were always difficult, either on account of the bad state of the roads or the want of means of transport. But after the affair of Pultusk, there were some thousands of sick and wounded in Poland, and it was necessary to establish hospitals for their reception. The situations for them were, however, not the most convenient, and effects furniture and utensils were wanting. The officers and attendants were not in sufficient number. Many were detained in the establishments formed in the rear of the army. Nevertheless, before the end of January, we had in Warsaw alone 21 hospitals and more than 10,000 patients were accommodated in them. The furniture and some provisions were procured by requisition, but contracts were made for bread, wine, and medicaments. The patients were brought to these establishments in wagons or on sledges. Men who were slightly wounded traveled to them on foot. In this way, means were found to evacuate in part the establishments of the first side of Nazilsk and Poltusk. After the Battle of Eilau, it was necessary to make new efforts. We were remote from any great towns where considerable resources might have been found. The hospitals, which were established, were crowded because it was difficult to find means of evacuating them. The emperor having required to be shown by an exact census the number wounded in the Battle of Eilau and the preceding affairs. All the hospitals were inspected in one day. 
The result is stated in one of the annexed returns. We open hospitals in Bromberg, Food and Schwedt, Neuburg, Dirschau, Marienwerder, Marienburg, and Elbing. In some of these establishments, the wine and light elements were paid out of the hospital funds. This was also the case with respect to the expenses for cleaning and medicaments. During this period, the proportion of deaths was 69 to the 1,000 patients, or at the rate of 29 in 10,000 days. Third period, in the beginning of May, the state of things became more favorable. The taking of Danzig on the 27th of May and the subsequent occupation of Konigsberg facilitated the arrival of provisions and the evacuated patients. These evacuations were made by the Frischhef on the Elbing and Danzig and afterwards on Bromberg by Marienburg. Muva, Marienwerder, ETC, the pressure occasioned by the crowded state of the Polish hospitals was in a great measure diminished. About 3,000 patients had previously been evacuated on Breslau, where there were spacious barracks which served for hospitals. The country supplied furniture, provisions, and medicines. Nothing was afterwards wanted but some French medical officers to superintend the treatment. The greater part of these patients left the hospitals cured. Nevertheless, the number of patients daily increased until the month of June 1807. On the 30th, there were 27,376, and it was calculated that the number of establishments then occupied could accommodate more than 50,000. But the sudden peace, which was the consequence of the victory of Friedland, rendered it necessary to contract to the line of the hospitals in order to evacuate the country, which was to be restored to the enemy. All the patients on the right bank of the Vistula were to be sent to Thorn and Bromberg before the 31st of July. The only exceptions made was for the hospitals of Konigsberg, Albing, Marienwerder, and Marienburg. On the 24th of July, there were only 470 patients at Konigsberg. From that date to the 25th of August, the admissions were 614. The removals, 734, and the deaths, 42. There, therefore, remain at the latter date only 308 patients who were nearly all dismissed cured. This hospital was formed on the 20th of November, 1807. In consequence of the measures adopted for evacuation, the hospitals of Thorn and Bromberg were in danger of being overcrowded, and it was necessary to prevent that inconvenience. An arrangement was made for removing the patients by the canal of the Nets, and they were evacuated on Kustrin, Berlin, Spandau, Potsdam, and Magdeburg. More than 20,000 patients were removed in this manner. The men belonging to the Third Corps remained in Poland, and those of the Fourth were distributed in the hospitals between the Oder and the Vistula. The hospitals of Elbing and Marienburg were maintained. The former was suppressed on the 28th of March, 1808, after the cure of all the patients. The latter still subsists and is about to be evacuated during this period. The number of deaths were in proportion to 95 days to the 1,000 patients or of 35 in 10,000 days. Fourth period, in the month of December 1807, the evacuation was completed. The patients did not leave the hospitals to join their corps until after they were cured. The line of the establishments extended from Elbing to Mentz and embraced Poland, Saxony, Pomerania, Westphalia, Hanover, and the Hans Towns. Every establishment received its patients from the court canton in its environs so that the convalescents had but a short way to go when they returned to their regiments. In the month of September, French officers of health were substituted for the medical attendants belonging to the country whom the necessity of the moment had rendered it necessary to employ. The hospitals were sufficiently supplied. The accounts and the registers were kept with as much care and accuracy as in France, the country defrayed nearly the whole of the expense as before. The medical officers, the clerks, and the French ser servants were the only persons paid out of the hospital chest. In this respect, the only exceptions were the hospitals of Leipzig and Wessenfels. In Saxony, a contract was made at the rate of one franc fifty centimes per day for the one and of one franc sixty team for the other. Finally, in several establishments, and especially those of Poland, wheat and bread, light elements, some articles for dressings and medicines were purchased. These exceptions, however, ceased on the communication of the Empress' decree of the 31st October 1807, which directed that 
All the expenses of the hospital should be defrayed by the countries in which they were established. From that period forward, the hospital service throughout the whole extent of the army was carried on at the expense of the towns. The principle was, however, modified with respect to the Duchy of Warsaw. In pursuance of a convention concluded with the court of Saxony, the emperor ordered all the expenses of the army in Poland to be defrayed out of the French military chest, and even reimbursements to be made from the 17th September 1807. The payments were directed to be made in Saxon bonds, and the reimbursements to be effected by a liquidation of which the chief commissary of the Third Corps had the direction. The sum of 575,000 francs in Saxon bonds was placed at the disposal of the commissary for the service of the hospitals in Poland, but no contractors for the hospitals were to be found, which occasioned considerable anxiety as to the future. To terminate the uncertainty, the minister of the Duchy of Warsaw for the Home Department consented to an accommodation, in consequence of which the daily allowance for a soldier was made 2 francs 30 centimes per day. And for an officer, 3 francs. Payable in bonds are subject to indemnification from the magazines established in Poland. This rate was very high, but the Third Corps had left Poland, and there were then few patients in the hospital of the Duchy. About the beginning of the spring of 1808, the number of patients increased considerably and several points were in danger of being overcrowded. Some new establishments were therefore open, and those then existing were enlarged, so that all uneasiness in that respect was soon dissipated. However, there were in the hospitals a great number of persons whose infirm health or wounds rendered them unfit for service. They were incurring the risk of contracting new diseases. This was made the subject of a report addressed to His Highness, the Vice Constable, who authorized the removal of these invalids to France. After they had passed two examinations, the first examination took place in the hospital in which they were the second which was definitive in one of the three central towns berlin hanover and frankfurt on the main the effect of this measure was to relieve the army from the burden of some hundreds of useless mouths at berlin 396 of these invalids were inspected and 39 at hanover out of this number 74 were finally discharged and 261 were sent in a state of convalescence to the depot of the corps no precise account has been received of the inspection which was to have taken place at frankfurt because marshal the duke de valmy caused it to be made at mentz and the return had been sent directly to the minister for the War Department. The number there was certainly less than at Hanover. The stationary position of the army afforded reason to think that advantage might be taken to the fine season to establish hospitals near the mineral springs. Warburn in Silesia and Rayburg in Hanover were pointed out by the first physician as the most convenient places. Unfortunately, the different corps of the army could not forward their sick as promptly as was desirable, and the extent of the establishments did not allow of their being attended to at once. It was therefore necessary to take the patient successfully more. However, then 500 men, soldiers, and officers have had the benefit of the waters, and very salutary effects have been experienced by one-sixth of that number. The corps that have sent sick to the waters were the 3rd and the 4th, and the Grenadier Division and the 5th and the 6th have sent chiefly officers. The Prince of Ponte Corvo's corps has sent only about 30 men. Because in consequence of the events which have occurred in Denmark, it has not been practicable to forward a greater number. The mineral water hospitals were formed on the 1st of October. By the month of June 1808, wagon equipage for all the corps of the army was supplied in the most complete manner. But the emperor, having decided that there should be attached to each regiment of infantry and cavalry of the Grand Army an ambulant caisson, containing surgical articles of the first necessity measures were adopted for carrying that order into effect. The regiments, which were not provided with caissons, received funds to defray the expense of making them according to the model adopted by the war minister and the linen for dressings, the linen and the cases of surgical instruments for the caissons were ordered from France. Sixty assortments of these supplies were sent and distributed to the 1st, 5th, and 6th Corps, the Grenadier Division, and 22nd Regiments of Reserve Cavalry. Fifty-six additional assortments sent from France have arrived at Berlin and are destined for the different regiments of the Army of the Rhine and the Hans Towns. No purchases of these articles have been made in the countries where the hospitals are 
established because they would have cost much more money there. And besides, those brought from France are of better quality. This observation is particularly applicable to the linen for dressings and the cases of surgical instruments. During the year 1808, attention was paid to the cleaning and repairing of the articles in the general magazine and those deposited there from the other establishments of the army. At pains were taken to complete the supply of linen and linen in case the army should have to take the field, 4,000 pounds of lint and 12,000 yards of linen were purchased in Berlin. 2,000 mattresses were made with the wool in the magazine, and the unserviceable linen articles were converted into bandages and compresses. 40 chests of prepared linen were got ready, and as many chests of article of the first necessity in pharmacy. Finally, 6,000 pairs of blankets were procured at one place. This acquisition completely completed the supply, which was indispensable for the war and was in every respect advantageous on account of the moderation of the price. They were purchased at the rate of 16 francs, 70 centimes the pair, while those from France, notwithstanding the difference in the quality, cost 20 francs. All these articles were packed up in the magazines, were ready to follow the movement of the army. Orders were given to send to the general magazine all the articles belonging to the French hospital in proportion as these articles became disposable in consequence of the decrees of the number of patients. In the course of the month of March, the emperor ordered the Peruvian bark seized by the custom house at Hamburg to be deposited in the magazine. The quantity was 3,420 pounds, according to the minute made on receiving it at Berlin on the 9th of April, notwithstanding this valuable supply, the economy hitherto observed was not departed from. In order to husband the resources of the country, experiments were made to ascertain whether substitutes for the Peruvian bark might not be found in certain bitters and in the bark of the horse chestnut. But as the experiments were not sufficiently numerous, it was impossible to determine the efficacy of the medicines of which the trial was made. The attention paid to the supply of everything now Necessary did not occasion any neglect in other parts of the service. The registers of the age, birthplace, and other circumstances connected with the identity of the patients were kept with the greatest regularity and care. The muster rolls and journals were so drawn up that the inquiries of families respecting deceased patients could be satisfied with the greatest ease. Finally, the regulations made by the minister who superintended the military administration respecting the disposal of the effects left by the deceased were punctually observed. The rigid execution of these regulations throughout the whole army was ascertained every month. During this period, the number of deaths was in the proportion of 35 to the 1,000 patients, or of 13 in 10,000 days. After these details, which may perhaps appear rather long, I leave it to the reader to judge whether the emperor was a cold-hearted man who fought battles for his own gratification and cared nothing for the sufferings of his troops. Can any sovereign be named? who more deplored the price at which he purchased glory, or whoever gave greater proofs of the paternal solicitude for the wounded. But facts which no one can dispute are the enthusiasm and devoted attachment which the soldiers at that period manifested towards his person, and the religious respect with which at the moment I am writing they all continue to regard his glorious memory. They never fail to say, that it was not he who caused the hardships they endured, but that to him alone they owed the consolations and benefits which they obtained. The reader will pardon this digression. I now resume the thread of my narrative. The losses of the army were repaired. It had magazines at Konigsberg, Danzig, and along the Vistula, a navigable communication by the first half from Danzig to Konigsberg and a canal from Konigsberg to Tilsit. Abundant supplies of every kind could therefore be easily transported to that town. Moreover, the enemy had constructed at Konigsberg a pontoon equipage, which they intended to use for the passage of the Vistula. I found this equipage complete with all its cordage and appurtenances at Konigsberg. There was then no risk of our being impeded by the passage of the Neiman. Besides all this, there was no longer any Russian army and at most only twenty or 25,000 Prussians, including the reinforcement obtained by the junction of the garrison of Danzig. In addition to these advantages, the emperor had the court of Marshal Davu and Seoul, which were not in the battle, and it was now only the 20th of June with the enemy's army destroyed. I ask every reasonable man 
whether a sovereign loving war above all things and cherishing an ambition dangerous to other states could be placed in a situation more favorable to his wishes ought not then justice to be done to him who renounced all the advantages he possessed and accepted the conditions proposed to him though only a few months before those proposed by him were refused there is no doubt that in the situation in which he stood the emperor might have done whatever he pleased and whatever might have been his projects it would not have been necessary to spend any longer time than the autumn in poland for example had he passed the neiman which he could have done before the 24th of june it is clear that he would have been on the Tvina in the beginning of july there was no fear of a battle for the enemy had no army to oppose him on arriving at vilna he might have proclaimed the independence of Poland, and there's no doubt that the proclamation would have been received with transport as the Poles came to him before he reached Tilsit to ask whether they might not begin the work themselves. He thus would have deprived the Russian army at once of the means of recruiting and being remounted. It could afterwards only be recruited by Russians in that under very difficult circumstances, for it would have been allowed no rest. For arming the Poles, the emperor had all the Prussian arsenals, besides the supplies which he had obtained from other quarters, from France, for instance, who then could have opposed the execution of this project, which must ultimately have been carried into effect had peace not been concluded. Certainly, neither Russia nor Prussia would Austria. This was the only power interested in interfering. We had a considerable army in Italy and Dalmatia. And before the Russian army could have been properly refitted, we should have had time to come down upon the Austrians and make an end of the matter with them while the Poles were clothing and exercising a business which would have been as soon accomplished by them as by the Russians. We should therefore have been in readiness to take the field in the following season if necessary. The emperor had given orders for assembling in Dauphiny and its neighborhood. The conscription which had been raised in the departments of the south, this force might have been sent to reinforce the army in Italy. Yet, notwithstanding all these advantages, peace was concluded. It must be confessed that this measure encountered no opposition on the part of the emperor and that here at least he had no other project in view. It is now time to speak of the other events than those of war and to give a faithful detail of all that happened from the emperor's arrival at Tilsit until his departure for Paris. At Tilsit there was a parley between our advance guard and the Russian rear guard from the latter. An officer was dispatched with a letter addressed to the general in chief of the French army to propose an armistice. It was known that the emperor of Russia was on the other side of the Neiman at a village not far distant. The emperor was resolved not to be duped as he had already been he was very willing to make peace but if peace was not to be concluded he would not agree to an armistice which could only have operated to his disadvantage to afford opportunity for those observations which are less easily conveyed by writing than by verbal communication the emperor sent marshal de rock as the bearer of his reply the marshal was i believe received by prince Labanov, who had recently joined the Russian army with some thousands of Baskirs, Kalmuks, and Cossacks presenting together a force of 10,000 men. This produced no other effect than to convince us that we now beheld the ne plus ultra of the effects of Russia in this campaign, especially as it was the first time she had thus had recourse to the services of her Asiatic subjects. Prince Labanov, who had no power to treat for the object of Marshal Duroc's mission, referred the matter to the Emperor of Russia, who was commanding the army and was near at hand. He proposed that Duroc should proceed to the Emperor's quarters. The Marshal replied that if the Emperor of Russia wished to enter upon any explanation on the object of his mission, he had no hesitation in complying, but on the contrary, would eagerly embrace the opportunity of paying his respects 
directs to him, directs answers so satisfactory to Prince Lavanov that the marshal was soon introduced to the Emperor of Russia. I believe that Duroc had no authority to propose an interview, but he at least had orders not to decline one if it should be offered. That is to say, his answer was merely to be that the matter had not been foreseen when he was dispatched, but if such were the wish of Emperor Alexander, he would return and communicate it to the Emperor and bring back a reply. I am the more inclined to believe that this was the fact because Marshal Duroc returned to Tilsit and was sent back a second time to the Emperor of Russia. And it was after the second mission that preparations were made at Tilsit for the celebrated interview. What confirms me in this opinion is that I saw in the hands of Monsieur de Talleyrand, who had just arrived at Konigsberg, the letter in which the Emperor directed him to come to Tilsit, and which contained the following observations. I haven't asked for an interview. I am but indifferent about the matter, but I have granted it. However, if peace is not concluded in a fortnight, I crossed the Neiman. At the same time, I received orders to prepare the bridge equipage, which I found in the arsenal, so as to be able to send it off at a moment's notice. I mentioned this circumstance too, Monsieur de Talleyrand. Do not hurry yourself, replied he. Where is the utility of going beyond the Neiman? What are we to find behind that river? The emperor must renounce his views respecting Poland. That country is good for nothing. We can only organize disorder there. We have now a favorable opportunity of making an end of this business, and we must not let it escape. At first, I was at a loss to comprehend all this, and it was not until our diplomatist unfolded his projects with respect to Spain that I understood the hints he had thrown out. Mr. de Talleyrand set out that time that evening for Tilsit, having first, however, dispatched a courier to Constantinople to acquaint General Sebastiani with what was likely to happen. The interview accordingly took place either one or two days after the turn of Marshal de Rock. The emperor, whose courtesy was manifest in all his actions, ordered a large raft to be floated in the middle of the river upon which was constructed a room well covered in and elegantly decorated, having two doors on opposite sides, each of which opened into an antechamber. The work could not have been better executed in Paris. The roof was surmounted by two other cocks, one displaying the eagle of Russia, the other the eagle of France. The two outer doors were also surmounted by the eagle of the two countries. The raft was precisely in the middle of the river with the two doors of the saloon facing the two op opposite banks. The two sovereigns appeared on the banks of the river and embarked at the same moment. But the Emperor Napoleon, having a good boat, manned by Marines of the Guard, arrived first on the raft, entered the room, and went to the opposite door, which he opened and then stationed himself on the edge of the raft to receive the Emperor Alexander, who had not yet arrived, not having such good rowers as the Emperor Napoleon. The two emperors met in the most amicable way, at least to all appearance. They remained together for a considerable time and then took leave of each other with as friendly an air as that with which they had met. Next day, the Emperor of Russia established himself at Tilsit with a battalion of his guard. Orders were given for evacuating that part of the town where he and his battalion were to be quartered. And though we were very much pressed for room, no encroachment on the space allotted to the Russians was thought of. On the day the Emperor Alexander entered Tilsit, the whole army was under arms. The Imperial Guard was drawn out in two lines of three deep from the landing place to the Emperor Napoleon's quarters and from thence to the quarters of the Emperor of Russia. A salute of 100 guns was fired the moment Alexander stepped ashore on the spot where the Emperor Napoleon was waiting to receive him. The latter carried his attention to his visitor so far as to send from his quarters of furniture for Alexander's bedchamber. Among the articles sent was the camp bed belonging to the emperor, which he presented to Alexander, who appeared much pleased with the gift. This meeting, the first which history records of the same kind and of equal importance, attracted visitors to Tilsit from a hundred leagues round. Mr. de Talleyrand arrived, and after the observance of the usual ceremonies, business began to be discussed. The Russian Minister for Foreign Affairs was Monsieur de Budberg, a man absolutely incapable of negotiating with Monsieur de Talleyrand. Consequently, the questions under consideration were decided by the two sovereigns. These imperial conferences lasted 
a fortnight. The mornings were allotted to business, after which the sovereigns dined together and amused themselves during the rest of the day by maneuvering the troops of some of the army corps in the vicinity until said. The Emperor Alexander had to treat for Prussia rather than for himself. The Emperor Napoleon had various interests to arrange in the first place. Poland, that is to say, the part which he occupied and which he had armed next Turkey which he had influence to declare war against Russia. Sweden had the misfortune to be governed by a prince who listened only to the counsels of passion and prejudice, and who could not be made to understand that if France fought with Russia, it must turn to the advantage of Sweden as well as of Poland and Turkey. He was at war with us, and all attempts proved unavailing to change his policy. On this occasion, the king of Sweden evinced less sense than the Turks. The latter had been unfortunate in their war. After being slowly roused from a long lethargy, they took the field, as they used to do, but Europe was now changed, and the antagonists whom they had found formidable in previous wars had got still farther before them in the progress of improvement. The port saw when too late the extraordinary exertions were necessary. These she dis determined to make, but just as this resolution was about to be carried into effect, a revolution broke out in the Seraglio. The Sultan was deposed and made prisoner by one of his own nephews who had adopted every precaution necessary to ensure the success of his guilty enterprise. Chapter 8. General Sebastiani, our ambassador at Constantinople, was surprised but not disconcerted by this unexpected revolution. He began to think of hurling down the usurper. He found means to communicate with the deposed and imprisoned Sultan, and he had already succeeded in making the Turkish army march upon Constantinople from itch, which it was not far distant when the usurper, alarmed at his impending fate, flew in a transport of fury to his captive uncle and strangled him with his own hands. However, the Turkish army arrived. The justice was executed on the unnatural wretch. Another nephew succeeded the unfortunate sultan. I learned these events only in a summary way, but it is certain that the movement which the Turkish army was thus obliged to make was fatal to those provinces of that empire which are situated on the left bank of the Danube. They immediately fell into the power of Russia and the Turks were unable to recover them. This revolution in Constantinople reciprocally changed the policy of Europe towards Turkey and that of Turkey towards the rest of Europe. It happened, unfortunately, that we were treating for peace at a moment when we had to stipulate for a sultan with whom we knew not on what footing or on what terms we were to stand. There was no time for ascertaining at once the intentions of the new sultan and settling with Russia the position in which we wished to place ourselves. However, Turkey could not be considered as an indifferent object. We could not understand with what view the revolution of the Seraglio had been undertaken as the late sultan was our friend and ally. It was suspected that a successor would favor the faction hostile to France. This appeared the more probable, as the new sultan had caused Prince Suzo to be beheaded as being an agent of the French party. He had indeed informed our ambassador that the port, to which he was then first dragoman, was treating for peace with England, which was the fact. Amidst all these events, we concluded that whatever we might do at Constantinople, we should never be able to establish ourselves permanently there. The Russians actively maintained in the Turkish capital an influence which was the grand object of their attention. And since they had become possessed of the chief part of the coasts of the Black Sea and the outlets of the rivers which fall into it after passing through the Russian states, their power had become too firmly established to admit of any counterpoise. The Greeks began to look forward to the moment when they should shake off the yoke which had so long oppressed them. The machinery of the Turkish government was deranged and presented no fulcrum on which to fix the lever that might have consolidated it. We had lost the only prince with whom we could stipulate with any certainty. In Europe, it has been customary to consider the Turks less as a nation than as a great tribe whom the Greek 
Hittites, who have become their superiors, may one day or other drive back into Asia if aided by a great power. We therefore preferred coming to an adjustment with Russia independently of the Turks and by that policy which justifies the actions of sovereigns. We availed ourselves of the circumstance of the Sultan's death to abandon the country. Whether we did right or wrong for our own interests, I do not pretend to decide. But it must certainly be confessed that we did not keep our faith, especially as we had let Turkey into the war. 